the Ayajame was to lead it, but he placed his man, one sergeant, uh, Alaji Martin, to mark the Ayajame just in case he tried to do any, something, and then he would be taken care of. And after that, you went to bed. The next morning, you went to State House because there was to be a Chinese ambassador who was to present his letters of credence. And uh, you found Kaba at the, at, the, at the State House together with the head of the NSS, and they informed you about disturbance that were going to happen. That is essentially what you talked about yes, so before the break, correct? Yes. <coughs> now, uh, you told us that you were told that when you asked about the vice president, you were told that he was upstairs receiving a delegation. Yeah. Uh, prior to that time, did you know whether a delegation of that nature uh, would be at State House? Absolutely not. At this stage, you were told that the vice president was receiving this delegation. Did you know what, does, what that delegation was to do in the Gambia? Absolutely not. As far as you know, was the president informed about, this, about the activity of this delegation? He said he was not informed. You subsequently discussed it with him? Yes. Uh, we would in, and then, uh, like I said, he's uh, in, in my natural uh, office I would walk to because being in charge of the defense of the country, and then uh, I was having these delegates from uh, uh, the, this warship, what we call it, or the frigate. So I thought I should go and consult him first, because when I learned that he was in, very, he was actually in probably very early, because given that if I got down there by half seven, I got down there between half seven and eight, so he must have uh, uh, got there well before I got there. So I, I thought I should go to him first and then uh, seek advice, you know, and inform him accordingly as well, because I assumed that when I was going, I didn't even know he knew what was happening. So I was surprised that uh, he actually is well in the picture of what was happening as he informed me when I arrived there. Do you know how he came to know what was going on? No idea. He just told me they are monitoring the situation, so and that's it. I took his word for it. When you left the vice president's office, where did you go after that? I was on the terrace for the time being. I think after I spoke to Sam Saab, then Pamudu An, then Jahumpa, I didn't see him walk past me to go to the president's uh, residence upstairs, which is opposite uh, the vice president's uh, office. You know, that's the current uh, residence of the president. So I decided it's about time to go to and talk to the president because I wanted to have a full grasp of the situation, you know, because I know the type of uh, uh, person I'm working with, Sadauda, so he would ask questions. So I gather all the information I can, then I decided to go to him. Uh, on my way there, first I saw Keba Sise, the Director General of National Security, coming from that end, from the president's bedroom end, the stairs coming out. And then while I was going up the stairs, that is when I met the vice president coming down. And uh, he told me uh, in Mandinka, he, he told me in Mandinka, Tadiam Wilanyin Kebae, Akamajata Baki. You know. What does that mean? It means, it means? Uh, this old man is very stubborn, um, trying to take him to the boat as a, for, for a sanctuary, but he refused to go. I wasn't privy to the, that communication with, between him and the president. Did he say anything else? That's the only thing he said. He said, see, he said see whether you can convince him. Yeah? He gave me those instructions. See whether you can convince him. You go and talk to him and see whether you can convince him. So I said, okay, and I woke up. You know, when I got down there, I didn't ask him whether the vice president even spoke to me about this. 
I said, I told him, sir, I understand there is some disturbance in the camp, and then uh, there's a suggestion that you know we should go to the uh, U.S. boat while we assess the situation. And he kind of frowned at me, and he said, uh, what for? Well, I said, well, in the, the, as, as far as it's, it's the camp is concerned now, we've been shooting down there, so we don't know the situation. At this point, I have no idea even whether it's a coup or not. So we started arguing. He said, he said, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm not going. He said he's not going anywhere. I said, okay. I sat on his bed. There was a bedside phone. I called the Yundum barracks. It was ringing the whole time, just like at Kabas office. I couldn't get anybody on the phone. So I decided to uh, call uh, Colonel Akoji, who was the acting army commander. So acting army commander told me, uh, well, there are some disturbance at the camp. And uh, he said, uh, I have, uh, I think he mentioned Mamad Cham with him there. You know, so that's the situation at the moment. At around what time? Was this? I am, I am not sure. It's usually between 8 and 9, around that, uh, around that time, around 9 o'clock or so. You know, so he, when he informed me, so I passed the message to him. I said, sir, you know, uh, then I tried to start to rationalize with him that, you know, the, there is no guard in the state house at the moment because they are preparing for uh, a guard of honor. It would be better if we can have a safe place while we assess the situation. He said, I'm not going anywhere, you know. So at that point, I left it at that, and I came down here again, tried to uh, wait for an outcome from Sam Sar, who had gone, to, I assume, then had gone to the Marine unit. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that? Well, there was nothing forthcoming, you know. I decided to then now get information that, uh, no, before I got the information, I came back again. Uh, for the second time, and I spoke to him, and uh, the same result again. I called. You spoke to who? Sadawda again. I the same result that he's not going. I said, okay, let me call Colonel Akoji again. But this time, Colonel Akoji informed me his in, his message was very specific. He said, Kasama, I think there is a coup going uh, on the way. And then uh, then he started narrating to me the installations or. Uh, barracks taken by the soldiers. Uh, tell, tell us what he said. Yeah, he, he was said. saying they've taken Union barracks, uh, Bonto, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the telecom station down there, and they've taken uh, Pajara barracks, and they've taken uh, Radio Gambia, and now they are at the bridge. You know, that's one second time I went down there. So when, de definitely that tells me exactly what's coming on the way. So I told the President, this time I said, "Look, sir, what he's, well, exactly what he told me. I, I relayed his message that they believe it is a coup, and then uh, this is what the soldiers are involved in. And then I told him the names, uh, like he told me, the officers who went down there. At that point in time, his message was: some of these officers said they are not part of it. Who told you yeah. that? Colonel Akoji, when I spoke to him." So he told me they said Which they are, officers did he mention to you? Uh, I think he mentioned Wilson was there. And then uh, I, I, I can remember Wilson and Mamad Cham at that time who were with him, uh, you know, uh, and at his house, at his residence. And his suggestion to you was that these officers informed him that they were not part of the he, group. He, he, said, not he said they made their way to, the, to him, indicating that they don't want to take part in this uh, particular. Uh, uh, whatever these people are up to, well, the coup. So he said that, and I informed that. I, I, uh, did Colonel Akoji told you at the time? Did he tell you at the time? Yes, he, he did. Uh, who was involved in the coup? No, he didn't. He, he didn't. He didn't give me any names. I had, at that time, I had no idea who and who has been involved in what. He didn't give me a single name. He just he just called them soldiers. You know. He didn't even say like officers also, just say soldiers, at the time he used. Apart from the briefing that you gave to Sadawda, do you know whether any other person uh, has given him a similar briefing? 
like, I cannot say whether when Kebasisa went up, whether he actually got to the house or whether uh, the vice president actually got to him because I wasn't there when they were, what, what they claimed to have, what actually did not, did not Kebasisa, but the vice president claimed to have uh, communicated to him the idea of going to the board, which of course later on he was denied categorically that never happened. Who denied that? Sadawla. Tell us what he said. He said he was at no point did the vice president come to tell him that he should go to the board. But this, this was the instruction I was given, you know, to go and said, as he said he refused to go, so you better go and talk to him and try and see how you can convince him. That's the first point of departure in terms of uh, the communication. You know. So the second time you went to Sadada, you told him that this looks like a coup. They have come up to the bridge. Uh, what was his reaction this time? Still, in fact, uh, I think he sat down at that point. He just said, let them let come and get me. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I haven't done anything wrong. He said, they can come and get me. So it was like resigned to his fate, whatever was going to happen. Well, uh, at that point, I said, you know, it's, uh, his safety is my responsibility. Uh, if he's not going to move, I have to find another way to, for him to move. Was it really your responsibility? You were just his ADC. You were not responsible for his security yeah, in the at, normal scheme of things. At, at, throughout this thing, at no point did I see the guard commander, I would say, make any effort, you know, to... Uh, I just suggest a way of, uh, you know, improving the security within the state house or this is the action plan. So completely from the office, I lost track of him completely. To be quite honest with you, I lost track of him. Track of who? The, the, the commander of the presidential guard. Who was that? Yeah, Kababajo. I didn't know where he was, what he was doing, what he was communicating. I have no idea. So I felt I was on my own at that particular time. So I felt it's my responsibility then, you know, like a military soldier, I mean, a military officer, you know, I have to take responsibility and find a solution to this, a temporary solution. That was my belief at the time, uh, as suggested by the uh, vice president. At this stage, where were the plain clothes officers and the bodyguards? Nobody around within. When I was moving, I haven't seen anybody around, you know. They could be downstairs somewhere or they could be with uh, Kababaju. I didn't see anywhere, nobody. When I was going up, I went there alone, coming down uh, alone, all by myself. What happened after you informed Sadauda? Yeah. The second when, time? The second, when, said, when he said he's not going, I just veered from his house. I went straight to a lady Chile's house. I, I briefed her exactly what the situation is. That uh, Tell us what you told her. Well, I told, I told her about the disturbance in the camp. And now our plan is now to take them to the, to the boat, uh, where it will be safe. I didn't even tell him that the president refused to go. You know, so I thought if I could get them to the cars, which we are led down by the vice president, Arin, with the U.S. ambassador, because they already laid their uh, vehicles down, ready to depart, if and when the president decides to come, come down. So I said, well, the first thing, the best way to go about this, get the family out first all the kids, because, you know, nobody was expecting anything, and they, all the family and the grandchildren were, were all around. So I went to him, I went to Lady Chilel, and then, yeah, see, see, for her, she accepted straight away. You know, my advice, started gathering, gathering the kids. This takes time, because it's a young, you know, toddler, some of them were. So... Do, do you know what he told the kids? Uh, the children, I think they, they were told, they were even told that they were going to the boat. I think they told them they were going to somewhere in uh, one of their families around uh, uh, half their area. They didn't tell them that they are going to the boat, you know. So, but hastily, in fact, I was trying to make them haste so that they can park uh, whatever they can and get to the cars. Why did you do that? Because I thought uh, then what I was, you know, it's like you're thinking on your feet. If I can get the family out to the cars first, then if I come to the president, I'll be able to convince him this time, and at least, you know, for the sake of his family, like I did eventually, we should go and have be somewhere safe at the moment while we assess the situation. 
you know, as suggested by the Vice President. And uh, what did you do after informing Lady Chilel yeah. about going to the boat? Uh, they all came down. It, it, it took a while to bring all of them down to the cars, you know, that were uh, laid downstairs and ready to, to depart. And like I said, whilst I was going downstairs, I met the chief driver, Pamal Anjaju, and uh, he said, uh, he said, Kasama, you cannot use a state, gar a state car. I said, why? He said, they will recognize us. So I just laughed and then uh, passed by him. I said, don't you worry, we're not using your car. You know, so because already then the American ambassador's uh, car uh, was lined up for the president to use that. Do you recall what time of the day it was? Uh, this must be between 10 and 11, around that, because at that time, they were, the soldiers were at the bridge. You know, they, they were at the bridge already. Uh, whatever was happening at the bridge, I had no idea, but I know that they came that far. So this is why I had to haste and I try to move them out of uh, uh, a state house and to the boat. At this stage, did you see the IGP the then IGP, Vassal Lejang, at State House? No, I couldn't remember seeing him, no. The permanent secretary, Minister of Defense, no, did I you see him at no. the airport? They would all be inside Sehu's office. Like, when I, when I came in, there were so many, my focus was on the, when I went to Sehu's office, straight away, I just walked straight to him. Everybody was sitting next by, by, by in, the, in the sofas. So it's, it's him I address straight away. And then I didn't even have to sit down. And then when he said they are monitoring everything, I walked out. So I couldn't tell who and who uh, was sitting down with him there. You arrived at State around 7.30 to 8. Yeah, 7.30 to 8, yeah. Uh, between 8. You said as at the time the vehicles were parked downstairs but, waiting for Lady Chilel and the children to not come exactly, down. Not exactly at that time. The, the, the time they were parked. Here, here, here are the question first. Uh, by the time the vehicles were parked at the doors, waiting f or at the staircase, waiting for the Lady Chilel and the kids to come down, it was around 11 a.m. That's what you said, correct? Uh, about that. I'm not keep, I can't be able to say the exact timing, but I can only go by the events as they were going, uh -huh. because this was exactly at the time the soldiers were at uh, Denton Bridge. And it's your guess that it yeah. was around 11, correct? Around, yeah, between 10 and 11, around that okay. time. Between uh, the first time you saw Kababajo, around 7.30 to 8, and this period you call 11 or around 11 a.m., did you see him again in between? No, I didn't see him. I did, that's why I said I didn't know what he was up to, what he was arranging, what he was organizing. I didn't know. I had no idea. How about Lang Tombong Tamba? Did you see him there at no, all? No, no, I haven't seen him. I think it's only Kaba I saw and I spoke to. At the moment. So, after you went down and you met uh, the driver, the chief driver of the president, and he told you what he said, and you re re responded that, no, you're not going to use his vehicles, what happened afterwards? Yeah, then the family were... But at the first place, I don't know who even actually arranged the convoy, the, the vehicle. I wasn't involved in uh, when they were laying, I mean, the, I mean, parking, ready to leave. You know, all I know is I was trying to get them. So by the time I, they, they came out, these vehicles were already down on the, uh, ready, ready to go. You know, I assume that uh, uh, the vice president had been giving me that instruction, had already gone and done that, did that preparation. Whether Kaba was involved in arranging that one, I had no idea. You know, but eventually he was able to uh, join us uh, before uh, we left, uh, left State House at that point. How long did it take for Lady Chilel and the children to come down after you informed them? I would say uh, I, I, it took uh, quite, quite a while, you know, because these are families. You cannot, you cannot just rush them like that. So about 20 to half an hour because uh, while they are all, when they are all on board, that's when I went back. Uh, to have uh, to talk to Salada again. What did you tell him this time around? When I told him again, I have got the same answer. He's not going. He's, still, he's not dressed. Uh, tell us what you told him 
told, and then what he responded yeah when i told him uh, we have sir we have to go these people are the, the soldiers are at the bridge now and you know, for your own security uh, we have to go he said he's not going he was just no, he was only wearing a singlet you know this uh, uh, point uh, how do you call it uh, uh, perforated singlet he was uh, wearing he, didn't, he wasn't even dressed and then he was resigned to his face sitting down i said then i started to rationalize with him I said, uh, your family, for the sake of your family, they are all in the car now waiting for you. We cannot keep, uh, put them at risk. You know, it's, it's better. It's not, uh, you, I told him you are not leaving State House. It's just that we cannot defend it as it is now. The best option now is to go to the frigate whilst we assess the situation. You know, it was only at that point and then he accepted to come. So I had to give him time, you know, to, to dress, get dressed, and then we leave. Did he pack any belongings? No, I know he didn't pack any belongings. Just his, I, can't, I, I can't remember him taking anything. Only got, got dressed. That's all. Briefcase, documents, nothing? Nothing I can't remember of that nature. I can't remember. And what happened after that, after he got dressed? Well, we went to the cars and we got into the, uh, uh, the ambassador's, uh, he used the ambassador's car and then uh, we left the convoy. Who was in the convoy, how long it was, I had no idea. All I knew is we were just uh, heading towards. Uh, in which car did you ride? With him in the ambassador's car. How about the ambassador? Uh, he was there in the car as well, yeah. The, the three of you and the driver? Yes. You tell us the route you, you took to go to the I think, frigate. I think we went by... Uh, uh, no, now, now I forgot this. Uh, Bokul or, I don't know, Hagan. I can't remember exactly. They, they were, we passed by the police station and going towards uh, the ferry uh, crossing, for the ferry terminal end to go to Post Authority. Which part of the police station? The custom end of police headquarters or the standard chartered end of police headquarters. I would say standard chartered in around that particular area. I can't be very specific about this uh, particular rule, but I thought we passed through there, because we passed through, I can remember definitely the terminal, and then uh, we went straight to, uh, to the boat. And tell us what happened when you arrived there. Yeah, when we arrived there, the entire family were taken to the lower deck uh, of the boat. Then uh, he stayed on the upper upper deck. Uh, there was a, a room for him where he was with the vice president and then uh, Bibi Davo. At what stage did Mr. Bibi Davo arrive or he, join, the, join the group? He somehow, I don't know, uh, by his own uh, account, uh, he was meant to go to uh, a marine unit. He was told to go to marine unit. Um, I think whether, whether the Inspector General of Police or the Vice President told them to go to the Marine Unit where all the ministers should report. But then when he saw the convoy coming, his car somehow joined the convoy. You know, it was not uh, as pre-planned, like he was meant to join us. So he saw the convoy, so he joined the convoy. Um, do, you, you, do you have anything to show who went to the boat? I have a list of... Uh, paragraph 27 of your statement, or after paragraph 27? Paragraph 28 yeah. of your statement. 28, yeah. We've got about 47 of us. That was a big number. <laughs> All of them were yeah. at State House. Well, this, some, some, not necessarily from St. Louis, because some were from Port Authority itself. Those who kind of, whatever reason felt probably are not safe enough, they just jump on board. You know? Do you know how this list was prepared? And by whom? Uh, this list was prepared by the vice president and then uh, given to Lady Chile.
Um, which, uh, who, who, can you tell us the name of the vice president? Uh, Sehu Sabali was the vice president then. He prepared this list while on board, and then uh, uh, Lady Chila is still keeping this list. I see that the list is typed. Do you know how it came to be typed? Uh, list what again? It's typed. It's, it's typewritten. It's not handwritten. Oh. Do no, I'm know? not sure how uh, how when when it was uh, when it was typed, but then this is how it was given to me when I called Lady Chile, who still had a, a copy of this uh, with her. Can you read out the names of the people who went on board? Uh, we have uh, slowly, please. Okay, Aja Hojasane, Ansusajo. Abu Jallo, Fatumata Jawara, Suleiman Sano, Mariam Jawara, Nadwa Basic, Maimuna Bojang, Cherno Jallo, uh, Omar B. Cham, Ramatullah Jawara, Ali Uketa, Chilel Sanyang, Njeme Jawara, that's uh, Lamin Bajo, that's Kaba Bajo, Bintu Job, Aisatu Baji, Hussein Jawara, Sophie Bari, as Lady Chilel Jawara, Ma Baba Solomon, Demba E. Sanyang, that's uh, Fode Jawara, Mari Jawara, Mfali Jabang, Arabia to Sisi, Malafis Sanyang, Jere Bojang, Sajo Jamme, Amadou Jallo, Malik Jang, uh, Sam Baj Samba, Ibrahim Sonko, Alaji Jaite, Pasal Lajang, Sadaouda Jawara, Chilel Jawara, Ibu Ondu, Abduba, and Sumanandau, His Excellency Sadawda K. Jawara, Lady Chilel Jawara, Bakari Dabo, Honorable, Cherno Jata, Captain Mamadou Kasama, Sehu Sabali H.E., Nasisa Jawara. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kasama. Uh, I noticed that uh, number 20 reads Chilel Jawara, but you read okay, it out uh, as Lady sorry, Chilel the, Jawara. The, the, uh, yeah, I thought Lady Chilel, but was, yes, Chilel Jawara is the, one of the daughters of uh, Lady Njeme. And uh, number 42 would be Lady Chilel, Lady Chilel Jawara. Jawara yes. uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so kindly tell us the events that took place in this boat when you arrived there. While on the boat, uh, the president wanted to find out uh, what's happening. Uh, because by this time, we learned that uh, we're just timely enough to leave State House because the soldiers were at, uh, around Gambia High School, uh, where they temporarily camped. And then uh, the president asked me to call the inspector general of police to find out what their demands are. So I picked the, I picked the phone there, I had a phone there, and I called Pastor Rajan. I said, the president said he would like you to go and find out exactly uh, what the demands of the soldiers are. You know, because up to this stage, it's still assumed to him it's a demonstration like it happened before. So Pastor Lajan uh, said his exact words, I don't know Kasama, just stay put. So I relayed that message, and then Bibi Dabo next, sitting next to me was filming with anger. You know, that, uh, that would be kind of response coming from the commander of the force. You know, he said, what? I said, well, that's what he said. He said, stay put, I don't know. So I left it at that. Did you inform Pastor Lajain that you were on the boat? Okay, he knows already we are on the boat. 
Do you know how he knew you were well, on the of, boat? Now that um, first with the benefit, and now he informed me he's been he was the first informed by the vice president that he is taking the president to the board, which he advised against. So not that's not to my knowledge, but he told, uh, later told me that, you know, before we even left state house, the vice president had informed him that he is taking the president to the board. And how did what did he say was his reaction? His to that? advice was against that. So you are suggesting that he later told you that he was against taking the president to the boat. Yeah, that's what he told. Uh, that's what he. That's what he uh, advised the vice president at the time. And uh, while you were at the boat, where was the U.S. ambassador? He's the, he's with the president there, and uh, yeah, in the cabin with the president. From the list that you read. There were only two cabinet ministers present with the president at the board, correct? Yes. So at what stage were you asked by the president to call the IGP? As soon as we settled on the board, I think of course naturally he wants to find out information about actually what is this all about, you know, so we can get a, a feedback. You know, uh, we, we already got a feedback. I'm not sure how with the Kaba informed me that they are at, uh, uh, because so many things were happening at the same time, try to find more information. You know, I, at that point, I had spoken to Samsar again, but this time he was at Radio Gambia. You know, somebody gave me the number, I think it must be Kaba again. Uh, I spoke to Samsar, and then he described to me uh, how the soldiers were advancing to Banjul how armed they were. What time of the day was this? Uh, we're still in the morning, you know, before, before uh, I would say around 11 or between 11 and 12, around that time. Did Sam Sar tell, tell you what he was doing at Radio Gambia? I didn't know how he got there. I didn't know Did how he, he tell there. you what he was doing there? No, he didn't. Were you surprised by that? I was surprised because uh, uh, I didn't know what transpired between uh, going to Marine to get me support and then ending up at Radio Gambia. Whatever transpired, then I didn't know at the time. At this stage, was a coup announced as far as you know? No, I had no announcement of a coup. At that point. It was still in the morning, you said? It was still in the morning, yes. All right. And what happened after that? You had spoken to IGP. He asked you to stay put. You spoke to Sar. He told you that he was at Radio Gambia. What happened after that? Then uh, uh, they, they requested, uh, they, I think it was the board commander of the board, uh, I can't remember the name, but that I speak to the tactical commander. You know, so I sat down with him, with Bajo in attendance, and uh, I gave him a breakdown of how the size of our army, <coughs> how we are deployed throughout the country. <coughs> and I told him by the, my appreciation, the way they are moving and, uh, and, and the positions they are claimed to have captured, to me it will indicate that there are less than 40 soldiers advancing towards Banjul. <coughs> so I, I told him that uh, this situation, can, we can deal with them. So and at this stage, you have not yet left the port? No, we haven't uh, left the port yet. So we, ha we had that discourse on, uh, he must have relayed this thing to the uh, ambassador, because of course he has to get authorization. So I spoke to him, uh, I, was, I, gave him I was in this particular briefing room, uh, talking to him when I had, not a commotion, but then I think uh, Pastor Lajan came on board, you know. No, I, I would rather say they, they, they had already agreed, because I told him during the briefing, the best vantage point to be observing this would be opposite the state house. So if the board could leave where, where they are, and then we go and go opposite the state house, so they'll be able to monitor whatever is happening down there. So they already started their drills of uh, releasing the, the boat, I mean the, the frigate of the harbor when Pastor Lajani was brought in. So I saw him being uh, kind of handcuffed with his jacket, worn halfway backwards with his hand behind his back. And then uh, they asked me, they didn't know him. 
the American soldiers uh, holding him. They were bringing him to the America to the, the president's uh, cabin. So I said, no, no, that man is the IGP, the Inspector General of Police. Yeah. So they went in with him to the cabin. I didn't follow them there. So I stayed with the, uh, the tactical commander. What happened afterwards? Well, uh, whatever happened to Pastor Rajan, I didn't know at that time, until by his later account. And uh, you had made a suggestion that the best vantage point uh, would be to anchor opposite State House. Yes, we, we left. I, I understand he, he wanted to leave, but then the, 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 they, said, they said no. This was my understanding at that point at the, uh, from the, the, the Americans. Who they, wanted to leave? Pastor Lajan, because having delivered his message, this was my understanding that he wanted to leave. They told him no, already they left the harbor. So they cannot go back, but this was completely contrary to what he told me later happened, transpired. What did he say transpired? He said as soon as he walked into the cabin. Go ahead. He was told that uh, by the president that, oh, you are the leader. And then from then on, they took him and then locked him in a cell. And then what happened? That's all for, he for, said? For me, I didn't see him again until uh, uh, when, uh, the, I think the following day in the evening. So I assume that uh, he is with the people downstairs uh, in the lower deck. So I didn't actually know about this particular incident. I had no idea he was uh, locked in a, in a cell because he's been accused of a leader. So I found it a bit odd that the uh, president who didn't know about the coup until that morning, been briefed and didn't even believe it was a coup for him to walk in straight away, sitting with the vice president and for the president to say, you are the leader. Where did he get that information from? Uh, if, if that is actually what has transpired by his own statement. Did you discuss this with Sadauda at any point? No, I didn't. I didn't. I got. I learned this uh, uh, not, not that long ago, but not at the point of uh, when I uh, Sadauda at no point mentioned that particular incident to me. Uh, but uh, your testimony is that since Pastor Alajan walked walked on board, mm -hmm. and you saw him being brought by the Americans, you didn't see him again until the following day. Yes. So after the boat left port, you saw Salah Pasala Jain walk in. What happened after that? No, we left. Now we the boat went around as initially suggested. We went to uh, opposite State House, not far from you know. Like one, 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 one thing also the commander told me that they had about 71 Marines on board, and then they have amphibious uh, landing tanks. You know, the whole idea was if they can come down there and come, they can surround the state house and force these people to lay down their arms. Because I told him whatever they had is stronger than our entire army together. So that was the rationale behind going around that particular uh, opposite state house where they could land. I mean, if they release the tanks, they'll be able to surround the state house, whoever is there, by force and force them to lay their arms. They can stop this, whatever was happening at state house. Uh, at this stage, it seems that the, the discussion you had with the Americans was for them to intervene and stop the coup. Yes. Uh, do and, you and, and, Yeah. Please carry on. And they believe that they can. Did you, do you know whether Sadao discussed this prospect with the Americans? He was informed about it, yes. Do you know whether he made a request to the Americans? Not, uh, not, no, I don't think we made the, uh, that, that particular request to the Americans. We, we, just, we had that discussion, and then uh, it must have transpired because I spoke to the commander. So naturally, I expect him to talk to the ambassador you know, who would have given the go-ahead for this particular maneuver to take place because he is the uh, de facto you know, uh, U.S. president on board uh, representing whatever. So he'll be the one giving the command. You know, so he would have informed. But I wasn't with the president, so I was with them. And then, so whatever transpired between him informing the president 
or whether the president make a personal request, I won't, I'm, I won't be aware of that. Okay, the vessel left port. Yeah, it so moved we were to there opposite uh, State House through their binoculars. You know, we can see virtually everybody in State House. Do you know whether there were any negotiations with the soldiers at all? Not at that point uh, when we went up opposite uh, uh, the State House. At, the, at this moment, we were just uh, trying to uh, ascertain exactly you know, the situation in the State House. Do you know during that time or subsequently whether the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Defense, went to the bridge to talk to the soldiers? I have no idea what was happening on the ground. Do you know whether at that point or subsequently whether in fact uh, some soldiers went to the bridge to negotiate with the, with the mutineers? Uh, no, I had no idea about that. While on board, you spoke to, you claim you spoke to two people. Did you speak to anybody else other than Captain Samsudin Sar and uh, this person? Uh, what's Pasala, his? Uh, Pasala, Pasala Jain. Jain, yes. Yeah, and the only third person I, would, uh, I, I spoke to was in the following day, Saturday was General Dada. Nobody else uh, as far as I'm concerned. Do you know whether Sir Dada called anybody at all? From Friday night, I understand he was talking to the Senegalese, you know, about uh, <clears throat> a possibility of uh, giving, giving him sanctuary there or possibility of helping as well. You know, he was uh, from Friday night going to Saturday, these negotiations were going on. Abdujouf. Uh, we, we will come to that. Okay. Uh, for now, let's focus on this Friday morning to the afternoon. You left, you are now anchored somewhere op opposite State House, you were able to see what was going on in State House. Yeah. How were you able to see? Can you? Well, they have that? very powerful binoculars, you know, they are on the, on this, so you can watch, you can, you can look, uh, which we try to see exactly what's happening on the ground. Uh, and tell us what exactly, did you, did you in fact look into those yeah, binoculars? Yes, you can see people walking, you know, just at the counter, just walking around, you know, Nothing extraordinary. Dancing you know. Bukharabu? <laughs> well, not necessary to that level, but then, uh, yeah, in police uniform, in all kind of mixtures, uh, working on the, on, on the ground. So there was no order to it. I didn't invent that. That was the testimony that when they went in there somewhere dancing Bukharabu, so I yeah, didn't I had, invent that. I heard that too, you know, he was dancing on uh, the president's bed. I heard that too as well. Yeah. And for how long were you anchored of facing State House? We were there about, for, I think, the second day. That's when until the second until day? Until the second day, yes. Okay. While you were there, you were watching soldiers moving up and down. Uh, can you tell us what was going on inside the, inside the boat? From my own perspective, I, I thought uh, the purpose of coming down there was for this amphibious thing to land. So why it is not happening, I wasn't sure. So I was going up and down to find out you know, if there's any movement there. So I went, uh, one of those going up, I saw the American ambassador talking and, uh, on the phone. As soon as he saw me, saw me approach, he stopped talking. Okay, it's, uh, that kind of fell odd to me. So I went down stairs. Just a few seconds, I walk back up again. I approach him, he stopped talking. At that point, you know, I was like suspicious of anything that will delay the whole action of soldiers being deployed that they had on board. So I went to the president straight away. I said, look, I said, sir, I don't trust the American ambassador. You know? He, uh, he said, why? I said, well, I explained to him what happened. You know, I said, uh, twice I got to him, and then whatever he is saying, he doesn't want me to know. You know, to me that sounds a bit uh, uh, dubious. And then the Sadar told me, you know, the Sadar gave me a long lecture about international relations, how America will, they will force condemn the school and then they will impose sanctions and before they authorize action. 
you know, I wasn't convinced. You know, I, but he, he very, very, was, he has been very calm throughout. You know, he at no point was he angry or out of control. You know, he maintained his dignity throughout. You know. Do you know what discussions took place among the cabinet ministers who were present at the time? I'm not aware of any discussion that actually took place in between them. Uh, like I said, I'm, I've been moving, you know, from uh, uh, point A to point B, uh, trying to see what's happening. The main purpose of our deployment in that particular area. Do you know whether the American ambassador take any, took any steps to, okay. to secure U.S. intervention? approval for U.S. intervention? I wasn't aware at the time that he made such uh, intervention. To me, as far as I was concerned, I saw it as a hostage situation later on because I, I, I could see it develop, you know, why the ship is not uh, deployed, Did, what, what's the delay. I didn't know and it wasn't communicated to me back. What, you know, what, do, what do you mean by a hostage situation can you explain that well uh, like i said uh, my like I, said, I had my opinion regarding the it's my own personal opinion about the american ambassador what was your opinion and about you know, the american ambassador that uh, in his person is a person who interfered uh, or was deemed to have interfered in the internal politics of the country i remember at a time there was a time he wrote an, an article on the observer uh, criticizing the government about the pace of the AMRC, the Asset Management and Recovery Program, and its pace, uh, virtually implying that whoever is uh, accused, you know, irrespective of due process, uh, should be just be, uh, you know, dealt with, you know, you can say unfairly. I understand. So, I mean, Sadara so called him, and then. Uh, uh, virtually told him to not to interfere. I said America has the long duress, longest duration of court sittings in history. So you must allow, you cannot just accuse somebody, you know, and then you expect uh, that person to be just summarily uh, tried. So you must allow the person to defend himself. He came to say, I was aware of that particular incident. So at this moment in time, you know, my decision was informed about all those put together, you know, whatever is happening. He is kind of being an obstacle for not allowing this particular deployment to take place, which I was assured by the commander that they can, and I know they had the capability and they can stop whatever was happening in the country. I wasn't aware that he actually made that request uh, to uh, U.S. or Pentagon, whatever process. To put it bluntly, you suspected the American ambassador yes, as at not that, being at that, point, at that point in time, yes. Whatever was happening, I suspect him to be part of it. At this stage, it was confirmed to you that this was a coup, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. So, and what happened afterwards? After you spoke to Sadauda and he gave you this, what you called an unconvincing lecture yeah. as to how Americans would deal with this particular situation. Not, not, not that I doubt what he explained, but then... Uh, uh, being a soldier, my, 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 my uh, instinct uh, where, you know, here is an opportunity uh, to nip this in the bud now. So I couldn't understand. Of course, of course I am green when it comes to uh, international protocols or relations. I don't know anything. I, can, I didn't question his uh, 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 rationalization of the situation. But I thought uh, at the bare minimum, not to fight, but if you can surround it and wait for others to come not necessarily wait for others to come before we come down. And this was actually my understanding of the situation uh, before we got uh, opposite uh, uh, State House. And the fact that it's taking that long, the longer it takes, the more I started, I begin to lose hope. So, of course, by the time uh, the boat arrived opposite State House, soldiers were already at State House. They were State already House. at State House, yes. So you could see them going up and down. Yeah. From what you saw, how organized were they? Very disorganized. Uh, I didn't see any organization at all. You can see 
people walking across. I, I, I can't even remember seeing people were like gun totting or, you know, brandishing their guns. No, people just walking, you know. It, it's a kind of a very a confused situation, if you can call that. But I don't see like soldiers particularly guarding heavily everywhere in kind of no order to the system. I thought that was the time, you know, for the, uh, to the landing to happen, and then we could have nipped it in the bud then, there and then. Uh, do you know what steps Americans, whether the, the, the commander of the American vessel took any steps to prepare for deployment in the event that he received an order? Well, I, I understand later, of course, they were opening the belly of, because we're going to see that we are on board, you know, kind of uh, threateningly opening the belly and then closing uh, kind of as a kind of a scare tactics that was in the idea, but then it still did scare the, the soldiers anyway. But we, I cannot see that I'm on board. But this was later on I came to uh, uh, learn of this particular uh, maneuver or tactics they were using. How do you know it scared the soldiers? Well, the, they made a request that they don't want the boat uh, close enough to State House. They want us to go more in, inwards in the sea. Tell us what happened later on in the day up to the evening. Uh, the following day, Saturday? For the following day. In the, uh, in the, the afternoon and the evening, what, if, what happened, if any? Um, no, I, know, I know we had uh, the communication line, but that was, well, that was the following day. But that particular evening, I'm not sure exactly uh, anything significant happened. Do you know whether Sardauda was able to talk to any of the neighboring uh, countries, any president in, in the neighboring Friday countries night, on that day, yes. Yeah, from Friday night, they started negotiating uh, about the possibility of going to uh, uh, Senegal, you know, uh, as a, a refugee or to give us sanctuary there, you know, on fr from Friday night. And I understand that was refused by the Senegalese. But the Gambia had, for the longest time, enjoyed a defense pact with Senegal. Yeah. Did Sadauda make a request for Senegalese intervention, as far as you know? Not when I was present, of course. I came to learn uh, this later, uh, and this one was torn down. <clears throat> At this point, I just want to bring, uh, if I can bring, uh, a comp just to compare exactly from some of the statements I had here, I thought it's relevant. Uh, I found the Senegalese position, why I found the Senegalese position a bit odd. Uh, it's, been, it's been narrated here by uh, Mamad Chang that uh, when he spoke to the Senegalese, General One, they were, they were at the border at the time. They came to help the Gambia by his own chest thumping or bragging, as I would want uh, to term it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, by his own explanation that he stopped them because he told them that they had about 330,000 uh, Senegalese here. If they do, he cannot guarantee their safety. At the same time, reminding them of what happened in 1981. Now, this is Senegal coming to help. Now, if somebody is that prepared to come to help, within 24 hours, the mere fact of receiving you and they refuse, I, I found it a bit odd. I was saying then something sinister to me, to my mind, must have been offered because you don't want to help somebody you, with your troops putting their lives in line to help the country. Next minute you will refuse to, uh, even refuse that, to, to receive that person in your country. I found that really very odd. Uh, uh, Mr. Gassama, I understand the point that you are trying to raise. Yes. Um, I do not want us to engage in a no, no, I, I thought this way. I, thought, I just thought at this particular point uh, is, is relevant just for, for food for thought. And then uh, I yes, uh, think about Obviously, that. There, would, there can be lots of explanations. I know. It, I know. I, it is possible that Mr. Cham referred to a conversation <laughs> with General Wan. Uh, we don't even know whether General Wan had already made a decision mm -hmm. that Senegal would come and help. This is just a conversation he claims to have had with General Wan. Whether it is true or not, 
or the extent or content of the conversation is neither here nor there. But the point, the important point you make is that Senegal, from the highest authorities, we are not interested in helping at all. At is, all. is that the statement yes. you want to make? Yes. Uh, regardless of anything else anything, we have. They don't want to see Jawara in, in, in uh, Saadawda and his delegates in Senegal. What exactly was it Saadawda was asking for from Senegal? Can you tell us? Well, thanks, because uh, my understanding, of course, the U.S. wanted uh, the boat to return, and they want to start order to come off the boat at some point. And then uh, the only place they can go to, next door neighbors, is Senegal. So that's what he, that's what they asked for, you know, initially as a sanctuary. So it had, to my understanding, is later on they had to take the uh, the U.S. government from there, and then the U.S. embassy in Dakar by the intervention of Ambassador Winters appealing to these both institutions to prevail on Senegal, at least to accept uh, receiving Saadara in Senegal. And then they laid down their conditions. You know, what were the conditions? That they will allow him to come so long as he does not engage in anything in trying to get back to power. At what stage did this happen? Was it while you were still anchored, facing uh, state house, or was it after you departed uh, the state, it, the it state was, house it, area? It, it began from Friday night. It was an ongoing process, you know, Friday night going through Saturday and then Sunday, you know, before they finally accepted, come to an agreement. It was an ongoing process. So you're telling us that it took a minimum of three days to convince Senegal to accept Jassa Dauda and his entourage. Yes. So, okay, let's take it then gradually, step by step. Uh, you said while you were anchored there, word was received from the soldiers requesting that the vessel be moved away from facing State House. Yes. That's what you said, right? Yes. Okay, what happened after that information, that request was received? Yeah, we moved back towards up till about around uh, opposite Cape Point and around Cape Point where the boat anchored. You know, we stopped around that and but we moved. You know, again, this confirmed my suspicion at that time. I was said whatever is happening is being aided by the American ambassador at the time. That was just a suspicion. That's just a suspicion. That's that is my, just a theory. Yeah, my, a theory by my own thinking, yes, at the time. And in fact, the American ambassador also has his own theory. Yes. And you must have read about that theory. Yes. And he blamed other people in government for organizing the coup. Yes. Uh, and uh, that suggested, it's self-serving, but it suggested that the Americans were blindsided, they didn't know anything. They, 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 in his own words, we've been hard. So what I'm trying to drive at here is that there are several theories. Absolutely. And unless there is special investigations about that, it would be difficult to, to know the truth about what exactly happened. I believe this commission can establish that. Uh, uh, well, we, the commission would not necessarily uh, devote its time to that. Uh, I mean, its mandate is to find out and investigate the human rights violations that occurred from uh, July 22nd onwards. What we are doing here is trying to get a contextual information, background information as to what happened. Uh, obviously, all these things are interesting, and the Commission is indulging you and hearing you on that. But uh, one may see it as a red herring. I'm not uh, going to uh, really... Uh, belabor that point. Uh, but it suffices to say that there are lots of theories yes, as to who was involved and who was not involved. Yes. Okay, but the bottom line remains that ultimately the coup makers announced themselves, correct? Yeah. And who were they? Uh, Ed, Ed, Edward Singate, to me, Bachwell was in charge. Uh, that's uh, he, he's the one I saw as being he's the one communicating with Sadawla, you know. So uh, at that mo moment in time, 
you know, yeah, Jamie didn't feature that much as uh, somebody who will be in charge of uh, tomorrow, at least from what we were getting. So it was Edward Singate who was communicating uh, with Sadara on the, on, on the board, so I took him to be the leader then. Uh, at what stage did he communicate, first communicate with, the, with this Sadara? Was, this was on a Saturday, around 5, five in, the, uh, in the evening, when they established communication, and then he had communication uh, through the, uh, the frigate uh, with uh, Sadara. Were you present during that communication? I was present briefly, not throughout the entire of the uh, the entirety of the communication. At the big initial beginning, of, uh, when uh, the their demand was uh, that Sadara can come back, as Edward was talking, he was talking, being very respectful. Were they making a demand, or were they responding to a demand? No, well, the, they were the, through the communication, uh, of course, uh, it's a two-way, two-way, uh, two-way route. I uh, was saying that, sir, that, sir, you can come back as an elder statesman, you know, but nothing will happen to you. You know, sir, that I was saying that you can go back to the barracks, you know, I promise you that, you know, absolutely you will all be forgiven, you know, nothing will happen to them. So he was kind of uh, uh, pleading with them to go back to the barracks. For how long did that conversation take? Long. Uh, 10, 15 minutes? Not, not long. Well, it was a deadlock. You know, they wouldn't, uh, Sadara would not come on those tasks. You know, he was insisting that they must go back to barracks. And he promised them that, you know, absolutely, they would all be forgiven, whatever they've done, you know, but then they must go back to barracks. Correct me if I'm wrong. At this stage, Sadawda still harbored hopes or expectations that he could come back to Gambia. As president, yeah, he could persuade them to go back. That they probably they don't know what they're doing, you know. So they should go back uh, to barracks, yeah. And then he promised them uh, that kind of immunity; nothing will happen to them. Who was present during this conversation? I don't know. I remember Bibi Dabo was there, you know, but I can't remember the vice president. Who else was present? Uh, the U.S. ambassador was there. The commander of the ship? Yes, was there as well, yeah. Did but the commander is when because uh, during their conversation with Peter and then I remember he made a remark that you know, this boy is sharp, you know, because of the accent. So uh, Who was he was who was he referring to when referring he said to Edward Singate. I was I was just I just told him that his, his mom is British anyway, what do you expect? You know. I was kind of annoyed with that command, if you can, because in the, under the circumstances, uh, I, I didn't want to convey any kind of compliment to them. And uh, what happened after that? Yeah, uh, after that then, you know, it was a slow drift, a very painful one, you know, away from the source of uh, the country. And then uh, but we had uh, still about four Marines which went uh, in the country, I mean, somewhere, you know, we left behind. I think they were waiting for those people to come. And they must have come from the American ambassador's residence to come and join us by a boat uh, to come uh, before we left for, for Dakar. What happened to the American ambassador? He came off before we went to Dakar, uh, having secured whatever negotiation he, he had done with uh, Senegal. He came off the boat and then the boat proceeded to Dakar. Do you recall which date, which day that was? This was on Sunday. Um, what happened to P.S. Jang? He stayed on board. I remember he wanted to go off uh, with the American ambassador, and he was refused that uh, uh, opportunity to come down. Did he say why he wanted to go down? Well, at that point in time, no, I didn't have any conversation with him why he wanted to go home, go, go, go down. Do you know of any particular reason why the Senegalese government accepted to, to, to receive Sadauda and his entourage in Senegal? That is, if he accepts the condition that uh, he can come and stay in Senegal without involving in any activity, political or anything otherwise, in trying to get him back to power. 
it's a kind of a refugee status, uh, status you know. Uh, what do you say to the suggestion uh, that the Americans insisted on going to Senegal regardless of the lack of approval simply because they had somebody on board who was sick and needed immediate medical assistance? To me, at that time, I thought it was a ploy, you know, to get us down. Once, once they get down there, you know, the negotiator, that's, I, that's how I saw it at the time, because I wasn't privy to other information. You know, so when they said there was uh, a soldier sick, I didn't even know it was a heart patient. I thought, now here, here again, they're trying to find a way, an excuse to dump us in Senegal. So you still had this conspiracy theory yes, in your head? I still had this uh, conspiracy, uh, you know, you know, in my head that definitely uh, here is the final excuse because uh, the ship of that magnitude uh, will be well sufficiently stocked with med me medical facilities. You know, if you have a knowledge of military, uh, you know, and as ad ad advanced a country, one of the most advanced countries in the world, would have virtually every means of uh, uh, treatment within their uh, on board the frigate. So yeah. I assume that this was a ploy to me. Uh, to take us to Senegal and then leave us there. Uh, just a matter of interest, was there a helicopter on board? I couldn't remember. No, I can't remember seeing a helicopter. I couldn't so when you said you s then started a painful drift, drift towards where? Towards Senegal. When did you reach in Senegal? When did it you arrive? Was, it was a Sunday, the same Sunday. You know. I can't remember the, the time we were in the evening or something like that. We arrived there Sunday and then uh, found vehicles were arranged there, laid out for us. So we hastily... Uh, presidential treatment? To No, I won't, this was not presidential at all. Absolutely not. You know, it was all rushed. So, so we were taken to uh, residence Medin. More uh, like incognito, you know, you, you have to go so that uh, you will not be recognized or something. So, while you were on board, did you at any time talk to the leadership of the army? I spoke to General Dada, and that was the second day. And I called him. Um, Yes, so fine. Then, then I think we all realized that you now we can now. Many people were making calls from their uh, mobile phones, so I had a bit of uh, life left in my battery. So I called him, and then uh, he said, uh, "The boys. His exact time was the boys, meaning the soldiers. They've passed by me, and I've told them what to do, what not to do, especially not to touch the civilians. So I, at the time, I felt so disappointed because I thought that was giving a helping hand." you know, to whatever was happening. But at that time, I didn't know the depth of his involvement uh, in the whole coup plot at that time. Are you suggesting that Dada was involved in Ab the coup plot? Absolutely. What is your basis for that? Because, uh, I, I, like, uh, at the end of this uh, whole thing, I, I kept on investigating, and then uh, officers, uh, uh, we will kind of have... Uh, uh, confide in each other, you know, what actually transpired at different points because everybody have their own perspective of what was happening. So when I put everything together, uh, I knew he was uh, an aggrieved general who was relieved to go back into Nigeria and he refused to go. And uh, in his own words, as he told me, that they've messed up the country, uh, in, that means Nigeria, but then not realizing that uh, that kind of was used, you know, in the, in the theory I had, uh, that uh, uh, he was uh, offered citizenship if he could pull this thing off to that level. Ultimately, he wasn't offered citizenship, was he? Well, of course, it didn't, well, uh, uh, it didn't succeed probably in the way or whoever offered him uh, citizenship, uh, the way, the manner it, it happened. But I understand from, uh, because uh, we got one of our orderlies who was Alpha Jalo, stayed at State House. Immediately they got into State House, Dada walked in there, 
you know, he was, he was coming in and out of State House. That is the information you That's received. That's the information I got from, yeah. yeah. But nonetheless, this theory mm -hmm. is punctured mm -hmm. by the fact that the coup has succeeded yes. and Dada was in giving citizenship yes. and he had to go back to Nigeria. Yes. So it's just another theory. Another, yeah, another theory. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so Dada seemed to convey, you seem to suggest that Dada was still in Gambia yeah. at the time of the coup. Yes. That is the following day when I spoke to him and I called him and he picked up his phone. I don't think in those days the phones can, I don't have any international facility to call anything so it can only be domestic. <clears throat> and I called him, it was domestic. What do you say to the suggestion that Dada had gone to Nigeria and he only returned the next day after the coup? Yeah, that's the next day, that's when I called him, that was a Saturday. I'm not, I'm not aware whether he had traveled. All I knew is he refused to go when he was called back. Uh, I had no knowledge that he had traveled to Nigeria the day before. But then uh, when I called him, he was in the country. So that second day, you continued to drift until you arrived in Senegal on Sunday, and you were taken on Kignito to your residence in Medin, right? Yeah. So can you tell us? What happened there? Well, when we got down there, the, uh, everybody gathered together. The president called everybody together. And then he uh, as, uh, traditionally recited Fatiha. All, all 47 of you? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, he ref uh, uh, recited Fatiha, prayed for everybody, and thanked them and asked them to return to their families. Did he expect everybody to leave? No. He expected his immediate entourage with him. I mean, like the people who normally will be with him, the guards, the protocol. Uh, and in this particular incident, he expected even Pastor Lajang to stay with us. Yeah. And what happened after? Oh, he said he has to go back. Who uh, he, said he has Pastor to go Lajang, back? He took permission to go back. Uh, said that as, uh, when I told him, informed him about that, he said, well, if he goes back, they might think that we are, up, we are up to something here, and they will torture him. This was his exact words. It's not safe for him to go back. Well, I said, you know, he said he wants to go back. He's a commander of the force. You know, well, he said, uh, if that is the case, he insists on going, and uh, they say he can go, but then uh, he will advise against that. Advice against that? The president, yes. Do you know when Pasala left? I think he left in the, that very evening. The following day, he was back uh, to his office. And then uh, when we heard that uh, upon return he was arrested, he just he said the same thing. He, was, he lamented the fact that only, if only he had he stayed back, you know, because this was something he was anticipating would happen to him, because naturally these people will be curious uh, the way he was rationalizing as to what is happening from Dakar N. Who else left soon after? Uh, soon after, not not not, uh, not immediately. It took a few days before the uh, uh, the chief of protocol left. Who was he uh, at the time? That was uh, Ibn Dur. And, the the, and who else left? And then uh, Kababaji also left. And what what was his reason for leaving? I don't know. I had two versions of it. What he told me, and uh, I understand he told the president that his dad is had a stroke and is ill. And then, uh, yeah, he had to go back basically to look after his dad. But uh, what he told me was, you have uh, this, as far as back home is concerned, everything has been sanitized for him. You know, he can go. Like uh, Tatin Baji, you know, they've done the groundwork for him to go. So the part about his dad illness, I didn't know at the time. But of course, that's what he told the president. I wasn't aware of that. So when he said he was going, I said, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I am staying uh, with the president. Uh, by, by that time, already they've made, started making this accusation of corruption. I said, uh, if I actually believe in what these people are saying, I'll be the first person to leave and the president. I said, but whatever they're labeling against him, uh, you know and I know the type of person we're serving. I said, I'm not going. 
and uh, the vice president and the minister of finance they also decided to stay he was with us for a while yes uh, he was with us for a while you know who uh, was with you I for mean, a while? So, I mean, so you said the vice president say that again okay the vice president stayed yes he stayed he was staying at hotel taranga again he was staying at hotel taranga we were staying at hotel uh, i mean uh, we were staying at residence medin and uh, he stayed until you left for england Yes, he was with us throughout until we left for England, yes. We want to know the relationships and the, the situation as it, as it obtains there uh, during this period, relationships. What was it like? Between who and who? The president and the members of his entourage. I, I didn't see anything untoward uh, uh, between them. Uh, basically, it happens to be in an area where my brothers were born, and I had my siblings. It's not far from uh, the residence. Uh, my stepmom, uh, Musukeba Sonko, my, well, my auntie, my mom's elder sister, they are of the same mother, uh, was living there. My mom wasn't there at the time, but she was. So this is where we would go for food. You know, she was cooking for us, you know, throughout our, our stay down there. So every day, you know, we'll go and then bring food. And they will come normally. Uh, we'll have meetings uh, to take stock of what has happened. And sometimes we will have uh, Mustafa Nyas, the foreign minister, you know, coming uh, to brief them, uh, whether any action or any action from the Senegalese government side until they arrange, uh, we arrange a trip to go and visit Abdul Juf. Let's talk about first the meetings that you had to take stock about what happened. What can you tell us about those meetings? Well, it's about the, I won't, at that moment in time, you know, as far as my role is concerned, you know, uh, let's say security wise, because I still defer, if you can call it uh, that. They, they can have their tete-a-tete. -tete. I won't get involved in that. So, like, I'm still more professional as a soldier. Now, I don't, I would tend to, when they are talking there, they're having their, uh, their meetings, I won't take part in that. So I'll be more like looking after the family, family side of this, because I've become like, you know, multiple roles, you know, try to calm down the situation, uh, make sure everybody is uh, at ease. You know, so when they are there, he, it will be him and maybe uh, the two, three of them talking, you know, but I'm not privy Who are the other two? particular discussion in between them. Who are the said. other two? You said three of them. Uh, yeah, the vice president who, uh, I mean, uh, and Bibi Dabo were there and Sadauda, and then the chief of protocol was there as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's five minutes to the lunch break, so you may have the floor to ask questions if you so choose. Thank you very much, uh, my counsel, um, for that. Um, I wonder if any commissioner has got any question to ask. Um, uh, uh, commissioner Carr, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Carr. Um, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that you've interacted with Jamme. Um, did you notice any notorious uh, uh, behavior or attitude um, in him? Anybody, anybody who knows Jamme, you know, even in the Zandam, how ill-disciplined he was. Uh, he is something that will not defer to authority, you know, because he built this uh, mythology about himself being uh, the son of uh, uh, Kanilai thing, and then he had a kind of a following, you know, because I knew this when I was with the Armed Forces football team. You know, one of the footballers, I think Sirif Sanyang, broke his leg, and then he claimed to have the means to be able to fix that with, other, with whatever mystic ways, and it didn't turn out to be so. But nonetheless, uh, he had this kind of uh, mysticism about him, 
that uh, you will find the likes of Musa Jammi and their uh, ilk uh, will clung around with him because of that. You know, he will not uh, uh, defer to authority. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, my Deputy Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, when you were reading out the list, an important member of the household was not named. <laughs> this was Lady Njeme. Where was she? She was in, uh, I think she was uh, in UK. She, was, uh, she wasn't uh, in the country by then. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Kinte. Commissioner Kinte. Um, this is a great experience for all of us, all Gambians, that uh, Yaya's emergence was a result of negligence um, because there were enough indicators that this man needed to have been tamed well before the occurrences. So um, that's one lesson we have learned, that uh, he's, he succeeded because a lot of people, the, 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 the institution was negligent, the individuals in the play, most of them were negligent, and they took a lot of things for granted. And the gentleman, uh, well, I'm, I wouldn't call him a dear gentleman, but the uh, bully had to take advantage of that to take up and mess us all this way. It's seriously regrettable. What are your points? My, my point is, uh, as some people might have alluded to it here, Yaya didn't have the capacity, you know, to start and organize this thing. He was a tool. You know, this is my theory, and then as my subsequent colleagues will come and uh, to confirm. Uh, because of it, that daring audacity, uh, he was used with, along with others. That's my theory. So, uh, involving some, some senior officers as well, because the, the, the conspiracy, as far as I'm concerned, is deeper than that. But the fact that he had the audacity, and then along with his, uh, yes, uh, it was to me an error of judgment by his command, and that they could have reined him in earlier, you know, with all the chances they had. You know, if a soldier is disciplined, there is no way you can cover it, and then uh, in whatever kind of loyalty you have. Your loyalty, first and foremost, should be to the constitution of the country. I mean, you are here to defend the constitution. So it's not look about any personal uh, relations as far as that's, that's concerned, especially if it's a threat to the country. Yeah. But then, yeah. Um, Commissioner Kaur, you have a question? Or? Yes. Sorry. Uh, something I wanted to ask, but uh, it escaped me for one reason or the other. I have a second question. You, from my understanding of your, uh, of your testimony, you said that um, the Americans, well, that was your own interpretation. Uh, for one reason or the other, uh, we are in support of the coup, if I got you right. But of course, uh, if I can qualify that, that was at the time. Okay. Yeah, but subsequently, of course, I came to know better. Oh. You know, but at the time, you know, there is no way of me, without any sufficient information available to me, I made those uh, judgments. You know, up to the time we went to hell was hit. You know, we sat down, we started to recap, exactly, we sat down, uh, how events went through, one by one. And then uh, everything seemed odd. Here is a U.S. boat, I mean, that came to the country. He's a, you are the commander-in-chief. You didn't know about it. There is an exercise. You didn't know about it. This exercise was meant to take place in Mandinari. Last minute, it was changed to be an assault on Banjul, giving the soldiers chance to attack Banjul. He didn't know about it, you know. And I was told to remove him in the state house as uh, the instruction given to me. He, he had refuted that, that form. So this set of circumstances, you know, I came to let, know later. You know. I, I just have a, a follow-up because you also mentioned that at some point they wanted him back. Uh, they wanted Jawara back, if I got you right. Yes, sir, but as only the, as an elder statesman. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bishop Paduko, you wanted the floor? Yes. Please, um, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Modulam in Gazama. On the, the morning of July 22nd, when you went to work and uh, you heard these rumors, 
we went to the vice president who was then the minister of defense to brief him on the matter. And then he told you already that um, they had about it and they were working to contain the situation. And monitoring. Then, they were monitoring the situation. Yeah. Uh, you met the American ambassador and uh, the commander of uh, the American frigate. Um, the, is it not a surprise for you to hear that at that very early hour of the morning that the Vice President and Minister of Defense to say that they had about something like that and they were monitoring uh, the, the situation? Yeah, well, with the benefit of hindsight, you can say, because uh, he wasn't meant to be in Banjul in the first place. He was meant to go uh, to his brother's uh, funeral, uh, as I later learned. That's why he wasn't at the airport. You know, but then by, apparently he was in the state house by 7 a.m. So how that happened, I don't know. You know, whether ferries can travel from 6 a.m. to get to Banjul, I don't know. But then uh, that was what uh, was alleged at the time. So, yeah, uh, everything was strange, you know, everything was strange. Um. Thank you, Imam C. Commissioner Imam C. Mr. Gasawa, I want to ask you when you were in the boat, uh, how did you uh, leave? What, was, uh, what, what, what were the conditions like, given the huge number that was involved for these two days? Nahari on a trop, trop because so you say so say the Hari Kanami Amna. Because when you look at the people's faces, the Nahari on trop, trop. They did not look. Even though Naka Gabiatuna, why the Pahala Ganana hat. The ship was wide, but to us, it was small. I was talking to one of my friends. When I looked at his face, I noticed he was not happy. You know, I can still remember that to this day. You know, time will be definitely the situation in the bank. At that time, the situation was really, really not very good. Thank you, Mr. Kazama. You had indicated or said very clearly that one of the conditions imposed by the Senegalese for the president to be allowed him in Senegal was not to do anything mm -hmm. to try to return to power yeah. here. Did that term of prohibition apply regionally or that he was not to do anything uh, within the Gambia uh, to try to come back here? Uh, the question I want to ask him relating to that is whether or not you are aware of any attempts that the president made with other regional leaders uh, in the West Africa sub-region? Uh, Mr. Chair, that was supposed to be the subject of the next session, but uh, <laughs> perhaps maybe he should wait until after the lunch break and then he would answer that, because the answer is a bit long. Knowing that I have the information, the answer is a bit long, so perhaps we'll ask him whether he'd prefer to answer now or after lunch. Well, the choice is yours. Um, I, I think I'll defer to the um, legal counsel. I'll just try to preempt you. So Thank, you very much. Thank you. Very so much. we can wait. Um, uh, but but we can to... still leave it as your question, Mr. Chair. <laughs> no, I, I, I would want it to be yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, that's um, uh, good enough. If there are no further questions, we will take a one-hour break and then come back at uh, 2.30 sharp. The meeting is adjourned.
Jaya uh, Jame was to lead it, but he placed his man, one Sergeant uh, Alaji Martin, to mark Jaya Jame just in case he tried to do any, something and then he would be taken care of. And after that, you went to bed. The next morning, you went to State House because there was to be a Chinese ambassador who was to present his letters of credence. And uh, you found Kaba at the, at, the, at the State House together with the head of the NSS, and they informed you about disturbance that were going to happen. That is essentially what you talked about yes, so before the break, correct? Yes. <coughs> now, uh, you told us that you were told that when you asked about the vice president, you were told that he was upstairs receiving a delegation. Yeah. Uh, prior to that time, did you know whether a delegation of that nature uh, would be at State House? Absolutely not. At this stage, you were told that the vice president was receiving this delegation. Did you know what, does, what that delegation was to do in the Gambia? Absolutely not. As far as you know, was the president informed about, this, about the activity of this delegation? He said he was not informed. You subsequently discussed it with him? Yes. Uh, we would in, and then, uh, like I said, he's uh, in, in my natural uh, office I would walk to because being in charge of the defense of the country, and then uh, I was having these delegates from uh, uh, the, this warship, or we call it, or the frigate. So I thought I should go and consult him first because when I learned that he was in, very, he was actually in probably very early, because given that if I got down there by half seven, I got down there between half seven and eight, so he must have uh, uh, got there well before I got there. So I, I thought I should go to him first and then uh, seek advice, you know, and inform him according as well, because I assumed that when I was going, I didn't even know he knew what was happening. So I was surprised that uh, he actually is well in the picture of what was happening, as he informed me when I arrived there. Do you know how he came to know what was going on? No idea. He just told me they are monitoring the situation, so and that's it. I took his word for it. When you left the vice president's office, where did you go? After that. I was on the terrace for the time being. I think after I spoke to Samsar, and then Pamudu An, then Jahumpa, I didn't see him walk past me to go to the president's uh, residence upstairs, which is opposite uh, the vice president's uh, office. You know, that's the current uh, residence of the president. So I decided it's about time to go to and talk to the president because I wanted to have a full grasp of the situation. You know, because I know the type of uh, uh, person I'm working with, Sadauda, so he would ask questions. So I gather all the information I can, then I decided to go to him. Uh, on my way there, first I saw Keba Sise, the Director General of National Security, coming from that end, from the President's bedroom end, the stairs coming out. And then while I was going up the stairs, I think when I met the Vice President coming down. And uh, he told me, in Mandinka, he, he told me in Mandinka, Tadia Mulanin Kebai, a Kamajata Bak, Prungata Kulun to a Manson. You know? What does that mean? It means, it means? Uh, this old man is very stubborn, um, trying to take him to the boat as a, for, for a sanctuary, but he refused to go. I wasn't privy to the, that communication with, between him and the president. Did he say anything else? That's the only thing he said. He said, see whether you can convince him. Yeah? He gave me those instructions. See whether you can convince him. You go and talk to him and see whether you can convince him. So I said, okay, and I woke up. You know, when I got down there, I didn't ask him whether the vice president even spoke to me about this. 
I said, I told him, sir, I understand there is some disturbance in the camp, and then uh, it's a suggestion that you know we should go to the uh, U.S. boat while we assess the situation. And he kind of frowned at me, and he said, uh, "What for?" Uh, well, I said, "Well, in the, the, as, as far as it's, it's the camp is concerned, now we've been shooting down there, so we don't know the situation. At this point, I have no idea even whether it's a coup or not." So. We started again. He said, "He said I'm not going anywhere, you know. I'm not going." He said, "He's not going anywhere." I said, "Okay." I sat on his bed. There was a bedside phone. I called the Yundum barracks. It was ringing whole time, just like at Kabas office. I couldn't get anybody on the phone. So I decided to uh, call uh, Colonel Akoji, who was the acting army commander. So acting army commander told me. Uh, well, there are some disturbance at the camp, and uh, he said, uh, I have, uh, I think he mentioned Mamad Cham with him there, you know, so that's the situation at the moment. At around what time was this? I'm am, I am not sure, it's usually between eight and nine, around that, uh, around that time, around nine o'clock or so, you know, so.